Alright, everybody. This is Marathia. I am recording this video today to show everybody how simple and easy it is to take a relatively inexpensive revelation out and go make redonkulous sums of money with it. Uh, this video is being recorded on the test server, as you may have noticed. Go ahead and close all that because it doesn't matter. Um, it's pretty straightforward. The site that I'm in right now is known as a Rogue Drone Patrol, or Drone Patrol for short. Um, it doesn't really matter that this one was already started beforehand. I'm just kind of making sure all my settings are working properly uh, for this recording. In fact, this might not even make it into the final video. We will see. I suppose the first things first, I will go over the fit. After I clean this site out, I just needed somewhere to put the ESS. Um, I will explain how everything is supposed to work. Pretty straightforward. Make sure turn auto repeat off on my siege module. Now the ESS, um, I guess I'll start by going over that while I kill everything off. One of the most important things when it comes to capital riding is how much money you can produce in a very limited amount of time. You're flying a very large and expensive ship, and so the less time that you can spend in space to achieve your ISK goals, the better. Now, the revelation that I'm flying here also... What? Oh, because I have something locked. That's funny. Uh, the revelation that I'm flying here is relatively expensive overall. Um, because this is a test server, it lies and says it's not worth anything, but I'll go over its cost uh, in a second. But with an ESS, you can increase the amount of money that you generate from each site by a significant amount. Um, the Encounter Surveillance System, which is what ESS stands for, gives you a flat percentage increase in the amount of money that you generate from a site. Um, the way it works is for every bounty, for every rat that you kill, you see all these rats that exploded, uh, for every rat that you kill, it takes 20% of their bounty and it stores it within the ESS. If you look here, access bounty, it stores it within the ESS and it shows a list of everybody who is ratting in that system. Now, um, when you go to pay out, all you have to do is click share, and like this, it will start a countdown. It takes, I think, 30 seconds or less, um, during which time you are Hector disrupted, so you can't actually go anywhere. Um, you also can't cancel, I don't believe. Yeah, you can't cancel it, but no big deal. Um, after the timer has finished, Everybody in the system is paid. Ding. You'll get a notification. Just like that. You'll get the 20% back. However, if you leave the money in the encounter surveillance system and you don't access the bounty and pay it out, if you, I mean, you can look at it, but don't, don't pay it out. After you kill a certain amount of rats, this will go up 1% uh, at a time until it eventually hits 5% bonus payout. So when you go to do a site like this, instead of getting only, um, say, let's say it was worth 30 mil. Instead of getting only 30 mil, you would instead get 5% uh, more of that. So you would get 31.5, right? Or whatever, because I suck at math. Fuck that. Um, now, the fit itself is pretty straightforward. Um Actually, before I get to this, I should finish the ESS. The other reason why the ESS is worth its weight in gold is it gives you loyalty points for killing rats. Now, um, for every 0.15, or uh, sorry, for every 1,000 isk in bounties, 0.15 LP is generated. And much like with the percentage going from 20 to 25, it can go from 0.15 to 0.2 in the same manner. So 
I don't know the exact number of rats that need to be killed in order for it to go up a percent. It's not a lot. You will very, very quickly hit 5% on your ESS. And when you do, you will start to gain loyalty points for whatever faction um, your ESS is for. So I used, I used a uh, Mimitar because Mimitar gives Republic Fleet. Republic Fleet is very useful in Horde as we use Munins. And Munins use... Uh, Mimitar ammo, of course. And then also we have um, a need for things like webs, Republic Fleet, large cap batteries are a pretty common item. And these are all profitable items. Loyalty points can be converted uh, into items at the res uh, respective stores. Um, those are found within stations in high sec and low sec that belong to the faction, to the corporation, rather, of the faction that you are using. So we are using our Mimitar. So we would have to go to a station owned by the Republic fleet to turn in our loyalty points. Relatively easy to do. Another good one to use is Kaldari because, of course, Jita is full of Kaldari and has a Republic fleet. Um, and Kaldari Navy stations, including Jita 4-4 being a Kaldari uh, Navy station. Um, but Republic fleet... LP and Kaldari Navy LP um, and even Galente and Amar, they all have their uses depending on uh, who your client audience is. You know, here in Horde, we use Eagles and Munins. Um, the loyalty points can be converted at a rate of around 1,000 ISK per LP. Now, what I mean by that is, like, let's say right here I have 72,000 Republic Fleet loyalty points. Well, if I were to take that and cash it out, and let's say I got only ammunition. That's really easy and straightforward. Um, the ammunition, I could sell it for 1,000 ISK per LP, meaning I don't have 72,000 loyalty points. I instead have 72 million ISK worth of loyalty points. Um, this is taken into effect after whatever other costs there are. Some items require you to have tags, which are gotten through Faction Warfare or bought in Jita, of course, from people selling them. Um, items like if I'm making Navy cap boosters, I need the regular cap boosters to turn into Navy. Or if I'm making a uh, faction uh, web or faction point like this one right here, for instance, in order to get this item, I would need to use a blueprint from the loyalty or from their store. And the store would require tags and it would require money, a small amount of money, and then of course the loyalty points. But there's a great and useful tool. I will put a link to that tool in the forum post that this video will be included in. Uh, it's Fuzzwork. Fuzzwork gives you real-time data for what items are being sold for in Jita, and it's very, very handy to look up the prices and conversion rates for loyalty points for what they're going for. Um, at the time of this recording, there is a couple different items. They're almost all of them ammunition, uh, such as Republic Fleet... Uh, I think it's Titanium Sabo M and a few other ones, I don't remember and it doesn't really matter, that are selling for anywhere between 2,000 ISK per LP and 4,000 ISK per LP. So when you're out ratting like this um, in your Dreadnought, you can expect your ticks to be anywhere from uh, 80 million to 100 million, depending on how lucky you are, how good the system is, how many other people are ratting with you, and of course, whether or not you have an ESS down. Uh, so if we go off of the example of saying, okay, well, I make 80 mil ticks. That means I get 240 million ISK per hour. Well, in addition to that, then I would also get another 20% of that as loyalty points. Uh, and 20% of that is 48,000 loyalty points which is another 48 million if I only sold it for a baseline of 1,000 per, or it could be upwards of 200 million more ISK if I sold it for, of course, 4,000 LP, or ISK per LP. Um, items that are really good generally tend to be sold by other people. A good example, you know, the Republic Fleet Warp Disruptor or uh, Faction Large Cap Batteries, those tend to be high supply to match the high demand and the, the the isk per lp for those tends to kind of be lower around one or two thousand per um but generally speaking most of the items you do not sell below one thousand um 
Implants can also be got, of course, yada, yada. So that's enough really talking about the ESS. Overall, if you're doing it right and you get people to agree with you that it is worth it to have an ESS down, it will increase the amount of money you and everybody else in that system makes per hour by 25%. Uh, 5% in terms of actual raw ISK being created, and then another 20% for the loyalty points being created at at minimum, assuming that you sell it for only a thousand per. Obviously, if you're selling it for more than that, you can almost double the amount of money you're making per hour. So, uh, now to the fit itself. While I have a second here, I will go over the fit. Um, this is not the complete version of the fit. I am missing a few modules because I was lazy. This is the test server. I didn't feel like going out and actually uh, picking them up and putting them in here. But generally speaking your fit is going to look very similar to this while you are actually ratting. You're going to have one quad Megapulse Laser 2. The quad Megapulse Laser 2 is a high angle weapon. It is used for shooting the frigates like you saw here, as well as the destroyers and things of that nature. Um, if they're close enough, you might use it on cruisers if your bigger guns can't track. In addition to that, you will have the two dual gigapulse lasers. Now these are anti-capital weapons. They're meant for shooting other capitals or in rare cases, uh, battleships. However, drone regions is rather unique. When you go to a site at 100 kilometers, all the NPCs are also going to be really far away. These NPCs, unlike other regions like Serpentis or Garistas, do not have long range. They are very, very short range. In fact, their range is around 30 to 40 kilometers at most. Because of this, they come straight to you in order to attack you. Now, as any of you who have played this game long enough know, if you burn straight out a ship with big guns, it doesn't matter how fast or how small you are, he's going to hit you fully. And in doing so, one-shot you. The other items in the high slots are an auto-targeting system too. Um, this is optional but it adds to the number of maximum lock targets that you have just for having it equipped. You do not actually have to use it. You don't have to turn it on. In fact, I wouldn't turn it on. Um, turning it on causes you to automatically lock things back. While this can be good, um, if there are too many NPCs on grid for your maximum number of lock targets, it can take up slots. So it's kind of up to you um, whether or not you need to use this module. Uh, I put it on my ship as a default because now I have 12 locked targets, potentially, and each wave is usually between 8 and 12. So by having this, along with having the signal amplifier down here, I get enough locked targets to lock the entire spawn all at once, and then sorting by distance, destroy them. You always want to sort by distance and shoot closest to furthest, regardless of size. So you'll put your capital guns on the battleships, you will put your haw gun on the frigates, and then when all the frigates are dead, you'll put the haw on the destroyers, the cap guns on the battle cruisers, and so on and so forth until you get into the middle, more or less. Um, if cruisers are closer than battleships, by all means, shoot them with the anti-capital gun. You will one-shot them, usually. There is a little gray area um, in range. Now to that, I will get to the next point, and that is the range of these things. Your anti-capital guns have much more range than your high-angle weapon, as you can see here. 124 kilometers with my anti-cap, my haw only has 100 kilometers. And then, of course, some significant fall-off. Uh, if an NPC is a battleship-sized target, some of those battleship wrecks that you see all the way out here, if they are anywhere from 70 kilometers to 140 kilometers, you're going to hit them almost perfectly with the anti-capital guns with Scorch. If they get closer, if they get within around 60 to 70, you're going to want to switch ammo. Now, I only have multi-frequency with me as a secondary ammo because I have really good skills. However, if you do not have really good skills, I highly advise picking up a secondary intermediate ammo, something like standard or possibly something like x-ray. Um, something with more range than multi-frequency, but still high damage. Uh, going back to... The mid slots now, the mid slots for your fit while you are crabbing are always the same. It's always going to be four tracking computers. There is no reason to run a target painter because target painters have very limited range. 
and there is no reason to run a sensor booster or anything like that because you run a signal amplifier in the low. Sensor booster does not give any locked targets. Signal amplifier does. So this is really important. Um, and you also only run four mid slots. You have refits in your ship, as you can see here. I have them in a container for easy access. These refits are capital capacitor boosters, like this one here and here. These take up a lot of space. That's why they're not actually in a container per se. In fact, I'll just go ahead and do that. Um, these are for if you get attacked, and we'll go over that in a second. You also have a heavy stasis grappler and a normal T-tube web. You want these. You can spend a little bit of money to get a better web, either abyssal or a faction. It's up to you. Um, generally speaking, the only time you will be using your webs is if you really manage to screw up and an NPC gets under your guns, which I will show you on the next site. I will show you what happens if an NPC gets under your guns, notably a frigate. You will have a smart bomb. Now the smart bomb is optional. They are expensive. They're 150 plus million each. Now if you're using an ESS to get your LP for something like this, it might not be such a big deal, but it is worth keeping in mind that they are a costly item because everybody uses them. Um, of course, this would go in place of your auto-targeter and would be used instead of the webs for dealing with any frigates that get too close. They orbit you nice and close. Smart Bomb will take care of them relatively quickly. Of course, you also need to have a Sino. I don't have one in this fit right now because I am on the test server, so it's pointless. But generally speaking, you will have a Sino. If you are worried or if it is a dangerous time, such as the upcoming blackout in the next week uh, for local... Default to having your Sino fit. The auto-targeter is nice, but it's not worth having it if it's one more thing you have to remember to put on. Uh, other refits include a 500mm micro warp drive. Now, in my particular case, I have a dead space, and this is not required, but it is handy. Um, a 500mm micro warp drive, in addition to your... Um, Inertial Stabilizer 2 will allow you to instantaneously put yourself into warp. So just like this, boom, bam, I now have a 500 MN and an Inertial Stabilizer. This will get me into warp in 10 seconds. On a normal fit, when you are normal running on TQ, uh, you will have one of two things. You will either have the tanky version of this fit, which will have capital and ciliary armor repair, a capital normal armor repair, and then some hardeners, and it will look something like this. You'll have your capital ancillary. You'll have it fit at all times, and you'll have paste in it at all times. This will never be unfit from your ship. Much like the Sino in your siege module, you will never take this module off because it will save your life. Almost every time, this will save your life. If you don't have this and you get caught, you're probably going to die before you can get it fit with uh, paste to save you. In addition to this, you will have a second capital armor repair. You can use an enduring or compact if you wish. It's up to you. I personally will not because of cost effectiveness. But again, personal preference. Now, in addition to that, uh, you will have your four heat sinks. When you go to travel between sites, these heat sinks will not be fit, and in their place will be one inertial stabilizer and three of these warp accelerators. I use limiteds because they are cheap. They're only like 20, 30 mil, something in there. So they're worth using on your ship. These, of course, increase your warp speed. Now, Without these, you can see I only have a 1.5 AU a second warp. That means if I'm warping to a site that's 15 AU away, the shortest amount of time it could possibly take for me to get there is 10 seconds, and then I have to spend another 10, 20, however long it is, slowing down or speeding up to get into warp. The micro warp drive trick with the inertial stabilizer means to get into warp takes 10, uh, 10 seconds, then keeping the inertial stabilizer fit, see here, brings my align time, or how long it takes for me to come out of warp, down. Now, it does not take actually 30 seconds to come out of warp. However, it will take you around 8 to 10 seconds to fully come out. But, 
because you have this module, when you go to slow down your ship by double clicking in space behind you like that, your speed will slow down a lot quicker because you have this module. It's very handy to have one of these in your hangar. So while you're traveling, you will look something like this. Uh, damage control and a reactive armor hardener. Now this is more or less what you will look like when you are traveling between sites. Now when you get into the actual site itself, because these are all passive modules, they don't take any time to cycle down, you will kick out your nester. I highly advise keeping a nester with you in your ship at all times. Um, these things are just too good to not use. What they allow you to do is by kicking this out into space, you can instantaneously refit your ship's modules, such as I did uh, a few seconds ago. That means I can open up my uh, fitting window like this. I can go click, 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 click. These are gone. And then I can go boom. And just like that, I now have four hardeners turned on or on my fit. And I can go one, two, three, four and turn the uh, hardeners on. This will save your life. You can use a nester when you are close to a gate. You cannot use a mobile depot. You can use a nester when you are near a citadel. You cannot use a depot. Now, you do have mobile depots with your fit. Um, keep them in your cargo hold or your fleet hangar. Up to you. I do fleet hangar. And when you get into a site, the first thing you want to do is kick out your nester and start refitting for, for your normal combat operations. The second thing you want to do is to kick out the mobile depot because it takes 60 seconds to anchor. While that thing is anchoring, you are vulnerable to being attacked by players if you do not bring a nester. They can decloak, light a sino, blow up your mobile depot, or just reinforce it even, and you now can't anchor a new one, and you cannot refit. Uh, if you scoop the mobile depot and go to put another one down, they'll just blow it up. So having this with you will allow you to refit and be safe. Now the beginner version of this fit, I will address you guys, the beginner version of this fit does not include these armor repairs, it does not include the hardeners, it includes none of this. There are no refits to speak of except for a pair of webs and a smart bomb, perhaps. The beginner fit only costs around two and a half bill, two to two and a half, depending on where you get your modules and how much you pay for the ship. And the goal is you use it like a ratting carrier. If you get caught, you light a sino, you pray, but realistically, you die and collect insurance and call it a day. The more expensive advanced version of this fit will have in its fleet hangar two extra quad mega pulse laser twos. You'll have two of these. This is going to be very important because if you get attacked by subcaps, like most notably bomber fleets, you would just simply take these two giga pulse lasers and you would put them in your hangar. They take 4,000 M3 each. So you'd unfit both of those guns. If your mobile depot is out and has not been reinforced, I actually recommend you take one of the Giga Pulse lasers and put it in the mobile depot, then put the other one in your fleet hangar, and put both of your quad Mega Pulse lasers on. Uh, in order of importance, the first thing you need to make sure you get fit is your Sino. You need to unfit whatever you have and put your Sino in. The second thing is your low slots. You need to make sure that you put your extra capital rep on if for some reason you have it off you need to put on your four hardeners and turn them on after you've got them on these three modules your damage control your reactive and your ancillary hardener should always be on at all times they never come off your ship um, after that your low slots are good hardeners are on i would turn on my capital armor rep not my ancillary just the normal and then i'd go to my mids my mid slots, I would refit. I would just unfit all the things that I have in my mids. If it is a large bomber fleet, I would fit probably both of my heavy cap boosters as well as both of my capital cap boosters to my fit. Uh, this is going to be very important for you to stay alive. Now, as you may notice here, I am over on power grid. I, there is an implant for the advanced version of this fit. I don't have it in right now because I'm not running the advanced version. Um... If you want to save yourself power grid and, of course, thus save on an implant, running a compact on that as well as compact on your capital cap boosters can allow you to get away with only needing a cheap implant. 
Personally, I don't think this is worth it, though. Running a cheaper uh, set of modules like this is only going to, or not cheaper, but smaller set of modules like this is only going to increase the cost of your ship and not actually provide you with much in the way of performance. Now, uh, if you want to save even more and you do not want to deal with that, you can go with only one capital armor repair or uh, one capital cap booster and then just do three heavy cap boosters. It will be very similar. It will give you enough cap to run your fit cap stable pretty much indefinitely under regular newt pressure. You will just have to be careful with it. Um, so like, let's say I had no cap here. These are able to be ran overheated with my guns firing for a very long time. Each of these reps only costs around, I think it's half of a cap booster charge. Yeah, exactly half. Um, and they have a really long duration, 12 and a half seconds. So I would eat a heavy cap booster here, which has a 10 second duration and then a 10 second reload. And I would cycle my rep and it'll use up half of this. If you're under heavy DPS, you would cycle both reps. This gets used, then you wait to use the next one. This gets used, you wait to use the next one. And by the time you get to the third one, this one has reloaded and you're ready to do it again. Same goes with the capital. You can use the capital cap booster, do this, cycle both your reps. Do this, cycle both your reps. Having them set to auto repeat makes it so that you don't have to worry about paying attention to it. Um, having auto reload off on your capital and ancillary armor repair will make it so that you do not have to worry about when it runs out of paste, it turn off. Um, now, uh, auto reload off is important. Auto repeat is off as well. That way, when you go to run the rep, you manually overheat it. That's shift click to overheat like this, and then run it one time. That gets the most out of your repair cycles giving you 16,000 armor. That's a little over 10% of your maximum armor hit points per cycle. You only get eight or nine cycles uh, of nanite repair paste, so you have to use them carefully. This module, it runs the whole time mitigating DPS. It's great. This is only used when you are taking damage. When you get to around 60% or so armor, um, that is when I would cycle an ancillary armor repair. If you're going down really, really fast though, like they're just burning through you quickly, I would just run both of them full bore, don't stop, and then I would start considering overheating hardeners. Bringing extra faction hardeners like this is a very, very good idea. It's a cheap way to increase your tank without increasing your risk. Bringing four of each racial hardener makes it so that if you have thermodynamics five, you can overheat all of your hardeners, not these modules, just your hardeners. You can overheat them for a couple minutes each. They will burn out, and once they burn out, they automatically turn off. And so you just take it, drag it off of your ship like that, drag a new one on, overheat it, and turn it on. Uh, there's a small window when you're doing that with burnt out modules where you're not getting the resistance from it. But generally speaking, when you're being shot at by bombers and such, Having a two or three second window where your resistances are terribly bad is nothing when you have several seconds where your resistances are huge. See, they're only 80 to 87. Well, if I overheat them, now it's 84 to 90. That is a lot of damage reduction that you're going to have for several minutes with these hardeners. And then again, once they burn out, just replace them. I don't recommend using Dead Space, and I don't recommend using T2. Uh, Dead Space are extremely expensive, and thus if you do still die, it's a lot of loss. T2 use a lot of CPU and can make it very difficult to fit all the things that you need to fit and then still run your ship. Now that pretty much covers it for the refits um, for if you get attacked. Again, you'll have your four hardeners, your damage control, your reactive armor hardener, and these two reppers. Um, don't be a bad like me and put them side by side. You know, always have them moved something like this. And then have like your least important hardener next to your ancillary. So in this particular case, it would be your EM hardener next to the ancillary. Then you'd want to have like your reactive because you don't care that much about it. Your damage control. 
maybe another hardener or your rep, and then the rest of your hardeners. Um, yes, overheating them is going to cause more damage to your rep, um, but that's why you use it only on your regular and not your ancillary. Burning out your regular rep, while bad, is not nearly as bad as burning out the ancillary if it's still got paste in it. Uh, now we do have some extra refits, which I will go over real quick. These are basic refits for various purposes. Uh, if you are traveling, if you're going between systems and such, um, and you want to do it with only like say Asbel, or not Asbel, so Taru, things like that, um, anywhere without a fort, capacitor flux coils. These are your best friend. So capacitor flux coils, not sure how I did that, but um, capacitor flux coils reduce your maximum cap by a percent. So you see I have 75,000 cap here. Well, if I put eight of these on my ship, now my max capacitor is only 12,000. 12,000 is not a lot of cap. And that's actually a good thing. So because this has only got 12,000 gigajoules of cap, 100% capacitor for me is 12,000. Well, 3,000, such as what these heavy cap boosters give me, is 25% of my max capacitor. So if I jump into a system, I go down to 30% cap, so I'm down to only around 30,000 gigajoules or whatever, I can then immediately go one, two, three, turning on these three cap boosters, and go all the way back to full jump cap. Once I'm at full jump cap, I can just unfit all these modules, and the game saves the percentage of capacitor that you are at. So if I am at 100% capacitor, I unfit all these, I'm still at 100%, but now instead of only having 13,000, I have 75,000. Very handy if you're jumping into a system that doesn't have a Fortizar, or that if you're living out of a POS, something like that. Um, generally speaking, in Horde, it's not that important, but it can be a little bit helpful. It depends on what you're doing and how you fly. I keep them on me, just in case. You never know. They don't cost anything either. Um, again, you have uh, a point. I don't recommend a faction one, but I had this lying around, so why not? Two webs, one's a grappler for in case they try to get under your guns. One regular web for if they try to go farther away. Smart bomb. Sino is better, but if it's a case where you're not getting blops dropped, it's just a roaming gang, smart bomb might be more beneficial. Or if you're having to deal with a dictor. Um, and that's, that's basically it as far as refits for your ship go. Now, I did mention the nester. The nester is extremely important. They're not very expensive. Um, in Jita, they're anywhere from three to 500 mil. That sounds like a lot, but if you think about it, T2 fighters for a carrier. T2 fighters, a full flight of them is going to cost you 500 mil. You know, you're going to, you're going to get a lot of return from those 500 mil, but it's going to cost you. And that's a bad thing. Now, with uh, the Nestor, the Nestor is also going to cost you, but the Nestor doesn't die. And that's kind of important. Looks like somebody else is in here with me. That's kind of funny. Um, since the Nestor does not die, you don't actually have to worry about the cost. It's not a, it's a, not a sunk cost, really. Um, in addition to that, the Nestor has way more hit points than a mobile de depot does. Even completely unfit, because nothing you have fit to it affects the ship unless it's piloted, even completely unfit, you have 10 times the hit points in a Nestor as what a mobile depot has. So if it's a small gang of 5 to 10 people coming to try and kill you, kick out a Nestor, you instantly refit, and they can't kill it. So, win-win. If it's a large bomber gang, it might still die. In fact, it probably will still die if it's a large enough bomber gang. But if you simply launch the ship from your SMA, right-click, launch, launch it, and then you have your window open. So like something like this, for instance. I have the window here. I have my refits here. Not really. I'd actually have it probably like this and this. I would go right-click, launch from ship, immediately go click, 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 click unfit those modules, highlight, drag the modules in that I need, click, 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 unfit those modules, highlight them, drag them in, and then right click, scoop to ship, scoop to uh, ship maintenance array. Now, you can do
do it in sections. So as an example, I'm caught, there's a scepter on me. I kick this thing out. I immediately go click, 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 unfit all the unimportant things that aren't for tank, get my tank fit, and then scoop it back. That'll break their target lock on it, make it so they can't damage it anymore, start regening any shields that it lost. Then I would quickly launch it again, click, 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 unfit anything else that needs to be unfit, refit them in about 10 second increments, maybe 30 if you're a little bit slower or you have bad internet, and then boom, you're refit and your nester's still alive, you get it back into your ship. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to boat out of this bubble here, and I will go on to the next site and show you all um, how that is meant to be handled. Make sure I am good on my fittings. I am. Everything there. Cool. Um, I will leave this up at the end of the video so you guys can see it with the refits, but for right now, I'm going to close it because it's not really relevant. You always want to warp to a site at 100. Never anything else. Uh, warping to a site at 100 ensures that you have the best possible, um, that was weird, the best possible application to the NPCs that you're going to shoot at. Uh, if you warp too close, there's a good chance the NPCs will be under your gun. There is also a little bit of variance in these sites. Patrols are weird in that when you are in them, uh, sometimes you'll land 140 away from an NPC, sometimes you'll land and you'll be 70 away from an NPC. That's one of the reasons why we have three locus coordinator rigs to ensure that we have the maximum optimal range we can. This is the same as having an officer tracking computer fit to your ship. And this is the same as a T2 tracking computer if they're loaded with optimal range. So effectively, the Revelation gets to have six, or uh, seven rather, tracking computers fit to its ship. Now you see here, I double click in space, I'm slowing down. I immediately come to a stop at around one meter second. That's good enough. I siege, launch my Nestor from my SMA. The moment I do that, I can do that. I can do that. Now, I, of course, do not have as many modules on me right now. I am using the cheaper version of the fit, kind of hybrid version, actually. Um, oh, I want it load up. Okay, it's being silly. Whatever. There we go. I lock up all the NPCs. As you can see, this is an abnormal site. They are far away. That is fine. They're also not shooting me. They are shooting my nester, which is adorable. So I need to make sure to scoop that to the ship maintenance array. Oh, this was a preloaded site. Someone else has already been here. I see. That's why they're so far away. Okay. Well, either way, we can just get to it. Wapping all these. I'll wait for a frigate spawn and show you what to do with those. Pretty straightforward. Not being able to lock that one's annoying, to be honest, but eh, preloaded site, singularity, what can you do? Now, it is worth noting that he is way outside of my range, but even though he's way outside of my range, capital guns actually have a curve, an arc for their uh, application, see like how far away he is, that goes beyond what it's saying for fall off. So the edge of my fall off, where I should theoretically have 50% of my base tracking, um, for capital weaponry, it doesn't really matter so much because we're so far away that we're gaining tracking speed by them being far away from us. And, of course, by burning straight in. So, like, even though he's 150 away, I'm still hitting him for 6k. Uh, EM is very important. I guess I'll use this time to go over why the other dreads don't work. Now, the Nagelfar, the Moros, and Phoenix, um, they don't have proper fits for various reasons. The Moros, I'll start with that one, uh, has very good tracking, but has very poor range. And even if you load long range ammunition to it, your DPS is going to be kinetic and thermal. These rats are resistant to kinetic and thermal damage, specifically kinetic, but also thermal. Um, so shooting them with kinetic and thermal damage means that you're gonna do less DPS. They are weak to EM, which, of course, the Revelation does in spades quite nicely. Um, and as you can see here, you can even one-shot cruisers and such with impunity. I'm going to go ahead and kill some of these off, but leave the rest alone. Um, the Nag, while it does technically have EM damage, what it doesn't have is range. 
Now, if you're using uh, EMP, your optimal range and fall off are tiny, like less than 80 kilometers. If you use Proton, which is the longer range EM, your range is relatively good. It's still pretty bad. You only have like 70 kilometers, 80 kilometers optimal range and then whatever for fall off. But your damage then is nothing. You have like only a few thousand DPS, three or four thousand. If you use T2 long range ammo barrage, then you have the range, but now you're doing kinetic damage and explosive. So you're effectively almost as bad as if you were just using proton. In addition to that, you also have less tracking, which is a big no-no. Uh, the Phoenix, basically it can't use anti-capital weapons, period. It's unfortunate, but the Phoenix just sucks. Now, it does have the ability to use uh, anti-capital guns, or not anti-capital, but high-angle weapons for uh, drone hordes, and I will cover that in a separate video, perhaps, or maybe a second seg segment of this video. But that is a full haw fit, completely different, and it doesn't make as much money as using a revelation, not by a long shot. Now, there are only two frigates left. I'm going to lock them up. I'll get rid of one of them just so I don't have to deal with it. I don't need to be in siege, so we'll just exit siege. Oh, that was the final wave for this site. Oh, that's perfect, actually. Cool. Um, so, if an NPC is burning in on you like this, tracking computers, while they're great, aren't going to be good enough because of stacking penalties. So, your high-angle weapon here does a lot of DPS. It's about the same as a battleship gun. Um, but, it has the same battleship tracking. That means if this thing comes in much closer, Scorch isn't going to apply. Multi-frequency isn't going to apply. I, it would right now, but I'm not I'm not shooting it right now because I want it to get under my guns. Um, to that end, you can multiply your tracking by using webs and grapplers. I'm going to go ahead and unfit these two tracking computers real quick. I'm going to refit the stasis grappler and the web. Scoop that back to my ship maintenance ray. Now you do have drugs. I'm using Strong Drop and Pyrolancia. Um, the drop can be improved drop. It can even be standard drop. And if your skills are good enough, it can even be no drop. But I highly encourage it because it increases the chance that you will one-shot a battleship with your anti-capital gun. And that is very important. Um, same with the Pyrolancia. It's not necessary, but it will dramatically improve the chances of you getting a one-shot on a battleship. And if you get a one-shot, that means that that gun now can be used in 12 seconds or 6 seconds on the next target. Very, very important stuff. So here we go. He's underneath my guns. If I shoot him with this gun, I'm not hitting him. Miss, 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 right? Even if I had four tracking computers, even if with the strong drop, I'm still not going to hit him when he's this close. Now, Smart Bomb here, as you can see would hit him. He is close enough for my smart bomb to actually kill him. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wait for him to get into his perfect orbit on me, which should be around 2,000, as you can see here, because these things have tiny-ass ranges. Well, now, nothing I do will hit him unless I web him down. And you see his velocity here. Unlike player ships, the inertia on NPCs is ridiculous and almost instant. So he went from 220 meters a second down to 16. If I turn the web off, immediately goes back up. Back to his 220. This is a 90% web when they are super close to you. He's not super close, but he is really close. So let's we'll go ahead and grapple him. His speed goes down. Put the other web on him. Goes down again. Now, however, when we shoot him with this gun... We have a chance to hit him. We're not hitting him, but we have a chance to hit him. There we go. He got hit. Now, if I was in siege, that would have just killed him. I'm not in siege, but that would have been a one shot. Hit again. Boom. Yada, yada, yada. If you really want to ensure those hits and make sure that you kill him 16 meters a second, go ahead and overload your grappler. This triples your optimal range for a short period of time. And now that they're in a 
uh, higher optimal range, their speed, well, it's supposed to go down, but for whatever reason, it's not. Keep in mind that overloading that for a long period of time can have detrimental effects on heat management for your other modules. So use it at your own risk, basically. Now, I do not need to actually kill this whole spawn um, since the site is done. So I am going to go ahead and start my warp to the next site. Because he is grappled and webbed, he will not be able to keep up with me, which is funny. So I will actually pull straight away from him, and he will die relatively quickly. Actually, I think I'm approaching him because, yeah, that's where the site is. Alright, so I'm getting closer to him, whichever. Refits here. Get maintenance. Now, you can take and do stuff like this, where you pull, it will compact mode, where you pull hangers apart, making it very easy to activate them. I generally am quite lazy when it comes to uh, doing that with some of these modules. I tend to skip um, the normal cargo hang hanger like this, where my ammo and whatnot is, and keep it kind of just attached to my ship and then closed, but for like the ship maintenance array and your container for your fleet hangar, those I would absolutely en enable compact mode for and then kind of just make them their own space on your overview. Very quick, very handy. So we're going to go ahead and do this full site now. Um, go ahead and get slowed down. Almost there. Launch. I'm going to go ahead and siege early. Because I'll have plenty of time. Unfit these two. I now have my tracking on. I will now zap that battleship. Scoop. Once you attack it, the first wave spawns. This is known as the Elite Drone AI uh, spawn. When you attack the first NPC, the first set of waves turns on. And then it's just straightforward. Just kill them in order, size, biggest, smallest, or uh, closest to furthest. This is one of those areas where you could use a different type of ammo if you wanted to. And maybe, oh, <laughs> it helps to load Scorch. There we go. Now these two are further away. Put one gun on each of them. Maybe we'll get some lucky one shots. This will of course all be posted on the forums for you guys to view. Uh, the refits, I will include a step by step for people that need it or for our deaf bros that can't actually listen to this video. Um, I thought about narrating this video with, play or with little cards that talk about it step by step, but I don't have any creative software, and so maybe later in the future, we'll see. Otherwise, I'll leave you guys to just watch this, and uh, when we're done, I'll do a couple more sites. I'll do probably about 20 minutes or so worth of sites, and I'll just have that set to music because who wants to listen to me talk any more than I already have? So hopefully you guys enjoyed. Hopefully you've learned a lot. I guess that'll be it.
I suppose one thing I can continue to mention is your high angle weapon has twice the rate of fire of your anti capital gun. So you can usually kill two targets, two frigate targets, and one uh, of the same cycles of your anti capital guns. So it's usually more important to pr uh, prioritize shooting these smaller ships over these larger ones. And that's it. Site's complete. I would normally bookmark this wreck, but I'm on the test server, so I don't care. And I have 10 seconds left. And that's with talking to all of you, taking the time to actually do all of that. Now I will use this time to refit real quick. Refit this for this. Refit this for that. Now the system that I'm in right now, also I guess one thing worth noting, is the system that I am in has very few NPC spots, patrols. This is a .1, this is about as low of a system as you can get. Um, you need two to three patrols, depending on how good you are at clearing them. I personally recommend three patrols per dread pilot. Your average system is going to have upwards of 15 patrols, so your average system will hold uh, five dread pilots simultaneously. A system might be selected in the future. I'll have to speak with some directors about it uh, for use almost exclusively by dreadnought pilots because of how good it is. Um, but that is something that will have to be discussed. It is not in place yet. So more on that soon, TM. This is a pretty decent site, it looks like. I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic and you guys will get music on the rest of it.